G'day sisters and brothers, it's great to see you here. Wonderful to be in church together, isn't it? Seeing God's praises and hearing his word taught. Um, it's, I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed uh, getting into uh, uh, Exodus and I've been surprised at how much I've enjoyed this case law. I don't really enjoy reading it, but then as we look at it, I see, wow, God's law is so clever and wise. It actually improves people's outlook. They go from from being um, bankrupt and enslaved to leaving their enslavement with something to start again with. And they go from being liars to, to being encouraged to tell the truth. And so God's word is changing people and it restores them. And it's great to see those laws making it into our world today, isn't it? Into our country, we see there's uh, the very same laws that we've been reading about. So praise the Lord for that. Well, um, I wonder if... Um, if you're here for the first time, it's great to have you here. Please join with us, whether you're here for the first time or not, for a meal after church. We really want everyone to come and join, have a soup. And we've had to go into a lot of trouble. We had a power outage, so we're using a generator. So, you know, make sure you thank the team. Oh yeah, I meant to say, welcome online too, great to have you guys here, sorry you can't enjoy the meal, but let's read together 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Now that you've been purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for one another, one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of the imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Amen. God's rebirthed us and that word is living inside us and changing us. Let's sing. Oh Lord my God I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin and sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great
to sing about our great God. As we stand, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We don't deserve it, but you have blessed us and you continue to bless us. We thank you, Lord, for being such a wonderful and great God. Please help us to know you better today. Please help us to see our sin and confess and uh, to taste afresh 
the freedom of sin forgiven. And we thank you, Lord, for what we're going to learn. Please grow our little ones as they go to Sunday school, our teenagers and adults as we hear your word taught. Grow us and help us to encourage each other afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. It's great to have you with us. Steve's my name if we haven't met. Uh, wonderful to be here together. I don't know if you're aware, but between us, it's estimated we sponsor about 110 compassion kids. That's quite a lot, isn't it? 110 kids across the world. But just recently, MEC has been focusing on the island of Medan. Medan? Medan? Medan. Medan in Indonesia. Okay. Okay. Region of Medan, island of Sumatra, and nation of Indonesia is uh, where we're focusing on. And so next week, is it next week or week after, Rog? Week after, we have a guy called Bruce Boyle, who's the um, a compassion rep, is going to come along and, and uh, share with us what's going on with compassion. And we're hoping to raise another 10 sponsorships, so something to think about in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to um, just say to the kids, it's time for you to go out. And before they go, though, just don't go yet, I'm going to say to the adults, can you say good day to someone who you haven't met yet? And here's the question to ask them. What laws have you been grateful for lately? So that could be a bit tricky, right? But okay, kids, off you go. I think you love that eagerness. Hi folks, can you just continue those discussions later? Because I want you just to um, 
meet Simon Gadsby. I think many of you probably know Simon Gadsby, but um, I thought it'd be great for us to connect with, with some people, and uh, Simon's one of my mates from a while, but he is the first Gadsby to join us. The very first Gadsby. Tell us about when you've, because he's got, he's got a sister incognito here, um, Kate Dingelstadt, but he's also got Marcus there. But um, tell us a little about how you first came to MEC, mate. Yep. And my parents are visiting today. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Gloria and I visited MEC um, with the Maitland Live Mission team. We lived in Sydney at the time and we were looking to move out of Sydney. And um, so we had some friends that were on the team and we joined them to come up and Maitland Live team worked with MEC. Um, we ran a kids program over there and, uh, and we loved it. And we also got to know some of the church members quite well. And um, a couple of years later, when it was time to move, we decided to come here and be a part of MEC. That's fantastic, Mark. Yeah, you were mission-hearted back then. We can even say you weren't, it wasn't that you were chasing Gloria because you're already married to her, right? You didn't come on mission to find a wife, no. You'd already got that, sorry, I should have said that. Um, so tell us just a little about um, things you like. I know you're a great gadgets man. Um, I'm thinking of how you watched your house get built. Can you tell us that? Yeah, we're still watching our house get built, but um, uh, it's been a long-term project. Um, so the fun part there is I, I went and got a, um, a camera and mounted it on my brother's house, and he kind of mounted it for me, so that we could get a time-lapse video of them putting the thing up, which is quite, quite exciting, and we can also check it out every now and then, see if they're actually working on their house. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Pick up the phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us how you became a Christian, Simon. What, what got you over the line? You knew about Jesus all your life, but what got you over the line in wanting to be a follower of Jesus? Um, by God's grace, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, so mum and dad brought us up loving Jesus. Very thankful for that. At one point, I um, kind of wished that I had a more dramatic testimony. And then one day I realised that to actually wish that you had sinned more in your past is, that's not right. And um, I'm very thankful, actually, for the way we were brought up. But my story involves particular people who have been uh, used by God to help me grow as a, as a Christian. Uh, so my parents in particular. Also, there was a guy called Tony. He was my um, uh, Sunday school teacher for a couple of years. Oh, getting emotional. Um, <laughs> It, that was helpful, and uh, I mean, I've had lots of good Sunday school teachers, but then when I went to uni, I met the Bible, I met, met up with someone one-to-one, -one and we just read the Bible together, and that was a, uh, instead of all the things that I, you know, instead of just being head knowledge, it was actually, and, and prepared studies, it was just, let's just read it together, what's that say, how's that relevant to your life and mine, what can we do about serving Jesus better together, and that was a real growing point for me. Um, but it was, yeah, kind of around year 12, first year uni, where I, I grew a lot as a Christian and started committing to um, live my life for Jesus on my own terms, not just because I was brought up that way. Yeah, that's great. So Roger later is going to be talking about the fact that, we, that life can be very hard for us. What are you finding hard at the moment? Uh, Steve, I have um, been blessed by God with a couple of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to take it back? You want to leave it that way? <laughs> so, uh, uh, love you. Um, yeah, so I think through a stage of life where younger people are dealing with and struggling with um, wisdom and selfishness and pride, uh, I find that those are the things that I'm struggling with too in, in managing them and uh, trying to train them to be more godly uh, when I'm not <laughs> always more godly. So that's the struggle. Yes, um, I know it's funny, isn't it, looking at your kids saying, why are they like that? Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's because I'm like that. Um, so we are having hospitality Sunday next week. Are you going to be a host or are you going to guest somewhere? We're, we're happy to do either, but we're going to put ourselves down to host. Host. And you were telling me before, this is not kind of your natural place to swim, if you like, but you think this is really important to, to, to have hospitality with each other. Why is that? 
So I, I think it's quite telling that um, in, in Peter, in his letter, says, show hospitality without grumbling, uh, because, um, you know, it's one of those things that we know is valuable and important, but it does... I'm not really a people person. It takes me quite a lot of energy. I love being with people, and I love actually having people over, but it takes a lot of energy and for me, and I'm very thankful to have... Uh, married up into someone who's better at that than me, but um, you know uh, we work at it. And I also probably wanted to say that hospitality is naturally done in our home. But um, we can be hospitable, old or young. You know, at church, the barbecue in the park, or at we're at home, um, <coughs> married or single. Uh, lots of different ways to be hospitable. Uh, so when I, I love having people over, and we have home group every week. It's a regular pattern. I'm used to that, and I can I can do well at that. Um, but when we have people over for a meal, um, I, ju I just I just pray about it, and we spend time together, um, sharing our lives. And I find it very helpful to encourage them and be encouraged by them. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. So uh, we we are having Hospitality Sunday next week, and the deadline's by tomorrow. But if you just jump onto the news, you'll find it links to it. There's a there's a link, it goes to the form, and you get to just ask, do you want to be a guest, do you want to be a host? A few dietary questions, how many people can you have, or something, and a little place for comments. If you do that, we will match you up later this week. We'll have the perfect match for you, and you'll join with some others and have a meal in someone's house, or have some people come to your house. Maybe you might get to Simon's. Gloria's a great cook. Are oh, you going to barbecue, or is it Gloria? A soup? Oh, even better. Okay, let's pray for Simon. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for Simon and Gloria and the family, and we thank you for working in their lives and showing us a bit more of your character through them. We thank you for Simon's love for you, his um, desire to, to see his kids know you in a real and rich way. And Lord, please um, bless him as he fathers, as, he, as your husband, as he works. Lord, as he's a brother among us, um, please continue to grow him and us together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, mate. We're going to continue praying now. Um, thanks. Hi, I'm Leonie. I find the Psalms very helpful when it comes to um, prayer and praise. And the first few verses of Psalm 91 say this, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I'll trust him. For he will rescue from every trap and protect you from the deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers and he'll shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armour and protection. The country we're praying for today is Mauritania. I find very helpful following the prayer notes for Open Doors because I get to know where these countries are. I had to double check myself this morning looking at Mauritania and it's on the western side of the African bump. One of the Christians in Mauritania said this, Before I met Jesus, I was a Muslim leading a gloomy life filled with fear, fear of death. And now that person who wrote that is a believer and fear of, free of the fear of the death. There are about 10,000 Christians in Mauritania. You'd think that that should be, make, make them feel fairly, feel fairly safe, but not so. They get persecuted a lot by the family and by um, government and the churches are destroyed. Um, to leave Islam is to leave the family and sometimes it means that they are definitely ostracised from their family and the women particularly face a great lot of persecution and children are left with um, great danger and they're left with not knowing because their parents can't really tell them unless they're going to keep it a secret. So it's a very difficult place. 
as many other countries are. So let's, let's pray for these things. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you are our almighty God who can help us in all situations. Thank you that the Psalms help us to visualise you covering us with your pinions and feathers and Lord, we know that you are just so awesome and great. We can't really fathom how great you are, but we thank you and praise you that you are so great that you love us. And Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that the Lord Jesus died on the cross for us so that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and you will forgive us our sins. Thank you for the cleansing that you can give to each one of us. Thank you for the protection that you give us. And Lord, we think of those Christians in Mauritania. Lord, there's a lot of them, but they're living in, they have to live in secret because of the danger that's there. Father, I pray that you will comfort them, strengthen them. And Lord, I pray that you will shield them from danger. Lord, even to own a Bible in a country like that is, is, is fraught with danger. But Lord, I pray that you'll give them creative and different ways so that they may be able to encourage one another and to be able to read your word. Father, we pray particularly for the women who are treated badly and violently, Lord, by those who are around them who know that they're believers. Father, keep them strong. Lord, I ask that you'll help them to know you. And Lord, we pray for the children. Father, provide for the children a way for them to know about you so that they can accept you and, and follow you, Lord, even though it is, again, fraught with danger. Lord, while we're thinking of children, we think of our children here that are connected with our church. We thank you and praise you for the children who are in Sunday school in Christ right now. And Lord, we um, know that there's the 830 service too that has lots of children, and I pray that you will help and instruct each one of these children. Father, be with the parents. Father, we know that there are great challenges in parenting children these days with the temptations and the, um, the, the attitudes that are fraught in our society. Father, I pray that you'll give the parents wisdom and help the children to accept what you say to them, Lord, even through their parents. Father, I thank you for the free fusion night that had 14 people come that hadn't been to fusion before. Lord, I ask that you will help those young people to be interested in wanting to continue to come to youth group. Father, again, teenage years is very difficult. As um, Simon has alluded to, Lord, we pray that you will help our teenagers to be strong and to be steady and to want to spend time reading your word and listening to godly people parents and godly wisdom. Father, we thank you for the people who are investigating um, Christianity through the Life Series and Christianity Explain. And Lord, I ask that you will enlighten their eyes and their hearts that they might want to follow after you. Father, thank you for the children who learn about you each week in the schools, the many schools that are around Maitland. Lord, I pray that you'll enlighten their hearts Give wisdom to the teachers who teach, that they may teach well. Father, I pray that you'll help the children and the teachers who listen as well to receive your word into their lives so that at any point in time in their lives that they might turn to you, Lord. Father, we think of Kenzie. Father, we have prayed so much for this little girl and we know that you love her very much. Father, we're not sure why all this is happening. We don't really know at all. It just seems so sad and so difficult to us. But we place Kenzie again into your hands, your loving hands, Lord, that you will do what is best for Kenzie. And Lord, I pray that you will love her all the time and that she will be aware of your presence and your love. Father, we pray for the Taylor family who are caring for Kenzie too. It's a very tough, difficult time for them. Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen them, help them to be able to be encouraged by others who are around about them, Lord, at this time, that they will be able to endure even the difficulties that they're going through. 
we think of Paul Christensen too, Lord, who is waiting for a lung transplant. Lord, we ask that you will bring that about in the near future, Lord. Lord, we know transplants mean that somebody has lost their life. And Lord, it's a very difficult thing, but Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of the medical teams who are able to do these things, and we thank you for the people who are willing to allow their loved one who is deceased to donate their organs. Thank you for those people, Father. So we pray for Paul and we pray for Karen that you'll continue to be with them and help them to endure that they will soon see results for their prayers. Lord, we know that there are among those among us who are mourning at this time and we ask that you'll bring them comfort and strength. And Father, I pray that you'll surround them with people who will be able to just encourage them along the way and that they will be conscious of your, your comfort and your strength day by day. Lord, we think of the Central Australia tribe who've got language already in their, in their um, uh, in technology, Lord. We thank you that um, we can read the Bible on our phone and that people who haven't got their word, your word in their, um, written in, in their paper language, Lord, they've got it on their phone and we thank you and praise you for that, Lord God. So we pray for the, those who are working at getting this into paper copy at the moment. So Lord, we bring all of these prayers to you, knowing that you are a great and caring God. And I pray that you will help each one of us to be conscious of walking with you day by day. And Lord, that you will give us each wisdom and strength and guidance that we'll be able to encourage others along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, the Bible reading this week comes from Exodus 23, verses 1 to 9. Uh, it appears my phone isn't working, so I'll just use the screen in the back. Um, do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in wrongdoing. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. and Do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. If you come across an enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey or of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Do not deny justice to the poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent per or honest person to death for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds those who seize and twists the words of the innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know it, how it feels to be foreigners because you are foreigners in Egypt. Well, thanks very much, Millie. And uh, good evening, sisters and brothers. It's lovely to see you tonight. <clears throat> My name's Roger, if I haven't met you, and I'd love to meet you over some soup later on over in the hall there. It smells fantastic. In 1867, a German Christian, whose name I can't pronounce, established a small community to care for people with epilepsy. He called it Bethel, meaning House of God. By the time Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer visited the place in 1933, it had grown into a whole town with schools, churches, farms, factories, shops and housing for nurses, caring for 1,600 people with disabilities and numerous orphans. The scale of it is hard to imagine. Biographer Eric Metaxas writes, Bonhoeffer had never seen anything like it. It was the antithesis of the Nietzschean worldview that exalted power and strength. It was the gospel made visible, a fairy tale landscape of grace where the weak and helpless were cared for in a palpably Christian atmosphere. Now, I'm sure that's not the whole story. No doubt there were problems at Bethel. Nothing is perfect. 
But it's interesting to note how brightly this community of grace shone at the very moment that the darkness of Nazism was deepening across Germany. The gospel made visible a landscape of grace where the weak and helpless are cared for. I wonder if that's your experience of church. Don't just think of MEC, although if MEC is the only church you know, then please feel free to think just of MEC. But think of any church you've been part of, perhaps. A landscape of grace where the weak and helpless are cared for. A church like that would be a light in a dark world. A church like that would draw people towards Christ. A church like that would reflect something of God's character. We're working through Exodus, as Steve's mentioned, uh, taking time with the law of Moses, seeing God's character partially revealed in it, <clears throat> and how he loves truth and justice, and the vulnerable and grace. And we're asking God to shape us into his likeness more and more along the way. I love that prayer of humility and dependence. It says, Lord, teach us what we know not, give us what we have not, and make us what we are not. Today we're referring especially to our safe ministry policy, joining some dots between it and God's character. Now as soon as we hear the word policy, the room magically fills with sleeping gas. <clears throat> it does, and our eyes glaze over. And at that moment I thank God for these rock-hard, straight-back pews Designed, no doubt, by preachers. <laughs> Boring ones at that. The risk, of course, is that we see God's character and our policies as completely separate. We've got our Sunday church world here, where we learn about God from the Bible, and then there's the admin world here, where we have to tick some training and policy boxes to be able to serve on teams, especially with kids and youth. But I'm going to simplify it for you, folks. There's only one God... And there's only one world, his world. And it all joins up in him, amen? So if you've got the policy, I hope you've got it on the way in. We're handing them out anyway. Um, if you've got that policy there, just open it up. Safe ministry policy there. Um, <clears throat> don't worry, I'm preaching mostly from the Bible. <laughs> but open it up with joy. Now, it's not the Bible, friends. It's written by people. So where it reflects God's character and promotes best practice, then we celebrate it. Uh, where it doesn't, we, we adjust it. Um, uh, but you can see from our safe ministry commitment there, it's to, and I think it's on the screen here, to care for the vulnerable by actively preventing harm and abuse and by seeking to show love and do good as we provide safe programs. Note programs. Activities and events run by MEC. That's the scope of this policy. And what are we doing? Well, we're resisting the negative of harm and promoting the positive of love in those spaces. And we're doing all of that, the policy goes on to say, according to the law of the land under God. So what about vulnerable people? Who are they? Well, the policy um, gives us a little bit of a hint there in brackets. It says including, it probably should say but not limited to, children, families, people with physical and or mental impairments and the elderly. In a nutshell, those who may be in need of special care or support due to age, disability, injury or other ailment or circumstance. James chapter 1, verse 26, a famous verse, taught, tells our, us as believers to care for orphans and widows, vulnerable people. Here in Exodus 23, in verse 3, we read about the poor among us. In verse 7, it mentions foreigners, more examples of vulnerable people. So how do we build a landscape of grace for such folks? Well, it begins, funnily enough, by acknowledging that life is hard. I've only got two points today. Firstly, look out at the desert of life, and secondly, look up at the care of God. So looking out, firstly, at the desert of life, Ed Welch begins his excellent book, Side by Side, with this very simple sentence, Life is hard. It drew me straight in, and my life is nowhere near as hard as others. But it's true, isn't it? 
Now, it's not always hard. There's wonderful joys in life. Praise the Lord for that. But life is hard at times. It's no accident that Israel at this moment is camped in the desert of Sinai. The desert note of Sinai. As they receive a bunch of rules about what to do when things go wrong. And things do go wrong. Even in this small section of scripture, we hear of false reports, favoritism, the donkey of someone who hates you, bribes and oppression. Is God on a downer here? No. He's just realistic about life outside of the Garden of Eden. In case we think it's contained in the Old Testament, only listen to these verses from the New Testament that sound very similar. Romans 12, 17, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. James 2, 1, My brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Ephesians 4, 25, Each of you must put off falsehood. And Jesus himself with that catch-all comment, In this world you will have trouble. John 16.33 We won't build a landscape of grace, friends, with our heads in the sand, afraid to look out on the desert of life. Our policy talks about inappropriate behaviour and concerns and complaints. A healthy realism there. Now again, I want to say it's not all bad. We know that. There are many joys along the way. I love the way Martin Luther weaves the two together in the final verse of his hymn based on Psalm 130. This is one of my favourite hymns at the moment. Though great our sin and sore our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. His helping love no limit knows, our utmost need it soundeth. Our shepherd, good and true, is he who will at last his Israel free from all our sins and sorrows. I love that. If ever I'm lying on a hospital bed and you walk past the door, just come and say that to me, would you? It'll be a great encouragement to me. Now he's using Israel here as a nickname for the church. And there's a good rhythm here. Two lines about sin and sorrows and five lines about God's grace and love. Jesus' words, think of them in Matthew 10, verse 16. Be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. A healthy posture for this life. Dove gentleness coming out of faith and hope in God, serpent wisdom to navigate the challenges that sin inevitably brings. Friends, we won't build a landscape of grace by sitting here hoping for the best. It won't do, especially not here in Maitland. About 20 years ago, the Anglican Bishop of Newcastle asked Simon Gillam to plant a new church here in Maitland. The other Anglican ministers in the area heard about the bishop's plans and demanded a meeting at which they slandered Simon and the bishop. And that's putting it mildly. The bishop pulled out of the project and MEC was planted as an independent church. Now what I'm about to say is is out there on the public record A number of those ministers in that room that day were named in the Royal Commission into institutional abuse and they're either in prison now or they're dead. Sometimes things go very wrong. Now, if you're a victim of abuse by a church leader or anyone... I think I speak for us all here today when I say I honour your courage and your faith. And I pray you're able to speak up and get the support that will help you if you haven't already. Or if you're a family member or friend of a victim, we acknowledge you as well and pray God's protection over you as you walk alongside your loved one. We build a landscape of grace, friends, by firstly looking out on the desert of life and secondly looking up to the God who cares. 
Israel is in the desert and God is right there with them. He cares. On the mountain in Exodus 20, he spoke his ten freedom commands for all to hear, outlining the life of love. God cares. And from 21 through 23, he's speaking to Moses about how to uphold justice when things go wrong. God cares. And in today's reading, he outlines three principles that shape his care. And the first is truth, not lies. The setting here seems to be a courtroom. We read of witnesses and lawsuits, charges and acquittals. The truth matters to God and it ought to matter to his people. I swear by almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's the witness's oath in Australian courts that will be in session tomorrow. If the truth matters to every Aussie, how much more ought it matter to those who claim to follow the God of truth? Look at verse 1. You can see God's love for truth here. Verse 1, do not spread false reports. Verse 2, do not follow the crowd. Verse 7, have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent person to death. Verse 8, don't accept a bribe that twists the words of the innocent. Truth matters. And so God gives this comprehensive list of threats to the truth. And it's interesting that each of these boxes was ticked at Jesus' trial. You probably can see it already. A bribe was paid to Judas. False reports were spread. The crowd, stirred by emotion and rumour, abandoned any interest in evidence, as crowds always do. A false charge was laid. And an innocent man died. Let's just pause for a moment next to a very familiar event to us and acknowledge a very key truth here today and that is this. By nature we humans love lies more than truth. And we have proved it comprehensively when we crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. What an outrageous perversion of justice that was. Henry Lawson wasn't a believer, but he wrote a poem about Good Friday once. And listen to his insight here, which is pretty telling. In his final verse, his name is known wherever the foot of Christian man is trod. They worship in cathedrals now, they call him son of God. They ask for aid in his dear name when they suffer care and pain. And if he came on earth today, we'd murder him again. Even Henry knew. The human heart's natural interest in lies over truth. But praise God that through Jesus' death and resurrection, he washes us clean of our lies. Amen? And other sins, and he gives us a new heart that loves truth and that learns to speak truth and value truth, even when things go wrong, and especially when things go wrong. Have a look at your policy there, commitment number four. It's on the second page. If you've got it there, just turn over the page and you'll see it there. Commitment number four. It says, we are committed to creating a culture where people feel safe to speak out about inappropriate behaviour without fear of being rejected or ridiculed. See, we want the truth to come out and not to be covered up. It goes on, we are committed to listening and responding appropriately to concerns and complaints. Again, we want the truth to come out and not to be buried. Now, if the matter is of a criminal nature... You go to the back page there. I think mine's got torn off the sheet here over the course of the day. But we go straight to the police. Again, we want the truth to come out. And they alone are the people who are authorised and qualified to investigate alleged crimes. A landscape of grace, friends, will always contain the oak tree of truth at its heart. 
We've all seen the devastating or heard of the devastating impact of truth covered up. Trust is eroded at best. And that's what we're dealing with in Maitland and will be for the next 20 to 30 years in a trust building project that we are all involved in. Rebuilding project. Trust eroded at best, lives destroyed at worst and Christ dishonoured at all times when truth is buried. Sisters and brothers, may that not be our legacy. Let's commit ourselves and keep recommitting ourselves to truth, not lies, in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give four specific encouragements around this issue. The first is if you have a concern about inappropriate behaviour by a leader, please speak up. You will not be rejected. We will listen and respond appropriately. Sometimes inappropriate behaviour is really obvious. Shouting, derogatory language, physical abuse, rank favouritism. I mean, in my 15 years here as a a pastor, I thankfully have never seen any of that in any leader at MEC, but I don't see everything. And in any case, we need to stay vigilant through our training and screening of leaders and preaching sermons like this from time to time. But you see, other times, inappropriate behaviour is way more subtle. And we sometimes might sit there thinking, should I say something or not? Well, my encouragement today is please err on the side of saying something. We want the truth to come out. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, I I raised an issue and it never got dealt with, please come back to us. Secondly, if you suspect a crime has been committed, you must speak up so that the appropriate authorities can investigate. Thirdly, if you're tempted to spread a false report about someone, please resist. It's sin. It's displeasing to God and harmful to others. Now, if someone says something to you about a leader at MEC and you, and you think, oh, I don't know about that, Here's a possible healthy response. Have you raised your concern with the relevant people? And you could start with the safe ministry supervisors who are listed in this policy here today. We want truth, friends, not rumours and gossip. And finally, an encouragement to parents. From time to time, we can have a simple conversation with our children that could sound something like this. If ever someone says something or does something that doesn't seem right to you at Sunday school or youth or any other part or anywhere else you are, you can come and chat with us about it. We can say that to our children. And we could, we could go on. If we've ever given the impression as parents that we don't have time for those conversations, then we apologise. We do have time. Come to us at any time about any matter. We want the truth to come out. Now, I don't know, how are we going here today? (laughs) Who's happy? I don't like talking this sort of stuff, but I do pray it's helpful. Building a landscape of grace for the weak and vulnerable. Looking out to the desert of life, being realistic. Looking up to the God who cares, being full of hope. His care is shaped firstly by truth, not lies. Secondly, by fairness, not favouritism. See, if the tree of truth is at the centre of the landscape, then the fountain of fairness is right beside it. Have a look at the passage again. God loves justice. Look at verse 1 there. Don't help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Verse 2. Don't pervert justice by following the crowd. Verse, seven, verse 6, don't deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. And on the other hand, maybe a bit surprising, at least it was to me when I first read it, verse 3, look at it there, don't show favouritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we're very used to the Bible telling us not to show favouritism to the rich. It's all through the Proverbs, it's all through the prophets, it's even in the book of James. But here, God shows us how much he loves justice by telling us not to favour the poor either. 
Friends, we don't have a hope of even seeing the fountain of fairness, let alone drinking from it, without the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, who frees us from our obsession with ourselves and gives us eyes for what's fair for all, not just what's fair for me. Now this policy and others supporting it are expressions of God's fairness at their best. It's fair, isn't it, to leaders to outline clearly what their responsibilities are. And this policy does it alongside the code of conduct. It's fair to all members to outline pathways to take if there's a problem. And it's fair to everyone to care how things are handled. Have a look at commitment four again on your, on your sheet there. The third sentence, th- starting with throughout. So throughout this process, that's a process of, um, where there's a concern being raised, we are committed to protecting the confidentiality, dignity, health and well-being of all individuals involved. It's a beautiful commitment. I mean, it's, it's basic Christian love, isn't it? <laughs> that. I mean, what did Jesus say? Love one another as I have loved you. He's concerned for our dignity and well-being all the time. We get the chance to show it to others. Friends, the safe ministry policy doesn't make us care for people. Jesus does that. This policy simply gives shape to what it looks like to care well in Jesus' name. Now friends, I'll be frank with you right now. I don't trust myself to not show favouritism. I'm still too interested in my own comfort and ease. And that's one of the reasons there's a team of pastors at this church. It's one of the reasons there's a team of safe ministry supervisors named in this policy. It's one of the reasons we've got godly godly men and women serving on the admin committee. And the checks and balances aren't only within MEC. Each of our pastors is supervised once a month, helping us to develop as godly leaders. We're not where we want to be yet. Who of us is? As well as that, we've got the council of the FIEC, our network of churches, and our board of reference. And as well as that, through our affiliation with the Anglican Diocese of Sydney, we've got access to the director of their professional standards unit, whose counsel and advice enriches the landscape of grace here at MEC, so that the weak and helpless are cared for well. Truth, not lies. Fairness, not favouritism. Finally, mercy, not vengeance. So the tree of truth, the fountain of fairness, and the mountain of mercy. Have a look at verses 4 and 5. Fascinating. On the screen. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Remarkable. I've been reading the Bible for 35 years and I'd never read those verses before. Or at least I never took any notice of them. That's about as close as we get in the Old Testament to Jesus' call in Matthew 5.44 to love our enemies. The natural human response is vengeance, not love. Let me give you an example. Years ago, my brother stole two pieces of chewing gum from me. It was PK. (laughs) That's where the funny bit ends. In a moment of vengeful anger, I grabbed his citizen watch. It was a special 13th birthday present. I mean, watches, you had to wait for them back then. And I grabbed it and I threw it against the wall and I smashed it. Disgraceful behaviour. Imagine if someone did something serious to me before Christ got hold of my heart and freed me from anger and started to teach me mercy, not vengeance. Friends, we were Christ's enemies by nature. We didn't love him, honour him as he deserves. We ignored him 
and rejected his will for our lives. But Christ brought our donkey back, so to speak. And it cost him his life to do it. And then in the grip of his mercy, we now can show mercy to others. Now I don't know how I don't know what this looks like, to be honest, on the boundary fence of life when something terrible has happened to you. I've had such a blessed life. But Richard Driver knows. In the early 80s, Richard was asleep in his Tennant Creek home when a man entered his home and stabbed him in the neck. Richard was rushed to Alice Springs Hospital with a, what would have been a mortal bleed. And the doctors informed him that he was only a few millimetres away from death. Richard recovered. He returned home. He had a, a spiritual awakening and started going to church. He heard the gospel, submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, was washed clean on the inside and received a new heart of love from God his Father. Now, that's a remarkable story in itself, but it gets more remarkable. A few months later, would you believe it, Richard's attacker, Lewis, started coming to church. How would you be, eh? And Lewis got saved by Jesus. And in the grip of Jesus' mercy, Lewis confessed his sin, apologised to Richard for nearly killing him, and Richard forgave him. And they've been friends ever since. Richard's blind, you can see it there. And you know who leads him around everywhere? His brother, Lewis. This is a remarkable story of radical forgiveness inspired by the mercy of Jesus Christ. And it's being lived out right in the heart of Australia, in the desert. Jesus' mercy, friends, is so deep and wide that victim and repentant perpetrator alike can find healing and hope and a fresh start. Amen? Now I tell this radical story, which is almost unbelievable, and I wouldn't find it hard to believe it, only that I sat in front of Richard and Lewis up at the Catherine Christian Convention about five or six years ago and watched Lewis lead him around for three or four days across the whole thing. It's true. But these radical stories, they help us, most of us, I should say, in our more everyday stories of forgiveness. And let me say, you're probably living in one right now. <laughs> let me encourage you, brother and sister, take the donkey back. <laughs> can you do that? Can you look up and see how much God has forgiven you and can you take the donkey back? Stop taking matters into your own hands. Stop seeking vengeance it'll destroy you in the end Christ's mercy is wide and deep now let's be clear the mercy of Jesus doesn't override the need for truth and justice on the contrary it's when we know that truth and justice are being upheld that we can let go of the desire to take matters in our own hands but mercy takes us even deeper or perhaps I should say higher because it unites us to our God who sees all hears all, knows all, and will judge with perfect fairness on the day Christ is revealed. Amen? Let's ask for strength and wisdom to press on while we wait. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to read through Exodus 23, the first little part. Lord, we thank you for revealing more of your care in its detail. Teach us, Lord, to love truth, not lies. Teach us, Lord, to love fairness, not favouritism, and teach us, Lord, to love mercy, not vengeance, for you have shown mercy to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. While the band come up, folks, we're just trying to start a new habit, and that is to just spend a bit of time reflecting uh, on the sermon. So you'll see that code there. That's an opportunity to, if you want to, um, perhaps write a note to the staff, uh, write something about what the sermon meant.
ask a question. That's right. Um, or if you want us to pray something for you, only staff will see that. But uh, you don't need to do that. You can just sit there and think and pray. Uh, also, if you're new with us, this is another way for, for you just to register your name and details so we can connect up with you. We'll just take a few minutes and then we'll sing. This life I live. <clears throat> I'm going to stand and sing together. Verse 2 says, I died to sin upon the cross. My, I'm bound to Jesus in his death. The old is gone and now I must rely on him for every breath. Right, let's sing together. I live is not my own, for my Redeemer paid the price. He took it to be his alone, to be his treasure and his prize. The things of earth I leave behind to live in worship of his is the right to rule my life. Mine is the joy to live for Him. I died to sin upon the cross. I'm bound to Jesus in His death. The old is gone, and now I must rely on Him for every breath. With every footstep that I tread, what mysteries He has in store. I cannot know what lies ahead, but know that He
I will not fear to meet him there. I know my life is hid with him. Jesus still now the 
Amen. In a, in a minute, folks, we're all going to go out and get some dinner. So we, we, you, could, you might want to just file out that way. It's a bit lighter and uh, we need to get out reasonably fast so that we get all that hot suit. But um, isn't it great to be told our God loves truth, fairness, mercy, and he's at work in us to make us more truthful, more fair and more merciful. And uh, I was reading, having a look at Micah 6, 8, it says almost the same thing. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Let's, um, let's go and get some dinner.